that warm introduction and for giving me all these opportunities to present my work. I'm very happy to see a, a very familiar group and I have a, a pretty informal presentation today. But first, um, Judith Arnold from the library could not be here today, but she asked me to remind all of you, um, especially since I'm speaking on Shakespeare, that um, the Shakespeare medical exhibit starts um, in about nine days. So, and Eric is the featured <laughs> presenter. And Eric, is there anything you want to add about the exhibit that's? Um, no. I, I, I was told to have like about a 15 minute talk, so I was a little shocked to see myself listed as featured presenter. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my word. <laughs> this is right off their website. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> okay, um, all right, so on to my talk today. Um, I want to mention this lovely image. This is by an artist um, named Giovanni uh, Cipriani. Um, and Shakespeare striding through a storm-ridden landscape. It's actually a wall painting at Stanwich Park, now called Trafalgar Park. Um, and it was painted in 1770. Um, you'll note that Shakespeare here looks much more like a romantic poet than an Elizabethan drama dramatist. To me, he looks almost uh, Byronic, Byronic hero. Uh, I think nature is the protagonist here, um, but the dramatically depicted genius is withstanding nature and we presume inspired by it. He has his pen and his, um, his notebook right there. But this is also very neoclassical from the temple in the background to his very 18th century footwear. Um, as I learned about this wall painting and uh, Fiona Ritchie and Peter Sabor's work, edited collection, Shakespeare in the 18th century, and in their introduction they say that um, sh that Shakespeare was considered an appropriate subject for the interior decoration of a fashionable country house manifests his dom domestication in the period. The bard became part of everyday life and could be invoked by the wealthy as a means of demonstrating their taste and judgment. That might seem kind of obvious, right? We, we, we know Shakespeare as an, an icon and the, um, this almost perfect example of um, the everything we value in the humanities, but it was not always the case as I will be describing. However, I do think this is the perfect representation of what Shakespeare came to mean in the 18th century. My project asks though, um, can this figure also be a teacher? If so, how? How was he understood by teachers and students? How was Shakespeare, Shakespearean literature used and to what educational and cultural ends? Um, but unfortunately, don't get too excited. These questions are not going to be all answered today. So some caveats and provisos right away. This is a work in progress. It's an unfinished work with a due date in March. Um, so that's why when um, Walter generously allowed me to present here, my flyer said a working paper. So I'm talking about research is ongoing. You won't hear a lot of conclusions. You'll hear some uh, directions I'm pointing in. Uh, and you'll hear a lot about methodology and background information. The title itself um, leads me to some key research questions and methods. And I debated this title even last night. I was changing it and changing it back. So I'm still debating it. Um, teaching Shakespeare implies a teacher. And that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. That is a human teacher. Um, there are some implied teachers, but mostly just texts that Shakespeare is circulating in. Um, so I want to think more of the ways in which Shakespeare is used in teaching and learning, but it is a useful adjective. That is, what kind of Shakespeare a teaching Shakespeare? Um, classroom practices are very difficult to glean. I do have some, and I have some hints towards others. It's also, um, method methodologically speaking, it's also hard to demarcate exactly what 
group of texts to focus on. <coughs> the 18th century was a very didactic period. If anyone, if you've studied it even a little bit, you know. Um, it's also the period that made Shakespeare a household word, uh, word uh, in, within reach of the general public and a beloved national icon. So I had to decide what do I mean by education. Is Shakespearean criticism that flourished in this period, as I'll discuss, is, does that count as an educational material? Are popular additions designed to educate the masses? So, I mean, yes, of course those are educational materials, but since this is part of a larger project focusing on the training of young people in reading and writing, I have chosen to focus on a few particular areas, although those areas keep sliding in and out. The more I make the borders, the more I have to move my borders. So the pedagogical materials uh, I'm trying to find include materials used in classrooms, evidence of classroom practices, as I said, difficult, um, textbooks um, and primers, uh, and educational materials meant to be used in a domestic setting, such as short educational fiction, anthologies and commonplace books, even games, um, and materials meant for schools. And that's not an accident. Materials meant for schools is under uh, educational materials used in a domestic setting because they're really, when books are marketed, they're marketed to both groups. So often on the cover page, it will say for schools and for gentlemen at home. So in this period, some students were educated by tutors at home. Some students went away to boarding schools. Some students were um, taught in small groups um, by a teacher in their community. Um, in all of these cases, the paratext is more often, not always, but often more important than the content itself. So that is how this book is, what the title page says, as I just described, what the, the preface says, um, how it's being advertised. Though uh, in texts that go through multiple editions, changes in the content can be a very telling as well. Um, so this does not obviously include all didactic literature, but only that um, that purports to impart some kind of skill, and here again we get slippery, or deliver content to des designed to improve the intellect, which seems to be demarcated, but then you get into cultivating artistic appreciation and sensibility, which in the 18th century is a really important part of improving your skills and intellect, but appreciation and sensibility comes through the development of appropriate taste, which oftentimes involves the cultivation of feelings. So we can't use our binaries of intellect versus feeling. They're very much blurred together in this period. I'm not really focusing on essays that teach young people about morality or religion, Though again, sometimes those essays are used to teach them how to be better readers. Taste itself is a very problematic term. It's crucial to understanding education in this period. There are entire essays and lectures around that topic. Um, yet works in cultivating <laughs> taste also include genres usually not seen as educational, such as many novels, um, uh, essays, periodical essays, such as the Tatler or the, the Spectator. So it's not really a separate category uh, from education at a time when education for the middle um, classes was designed to help them climb the ladder. Um, and also moral behavior itself bleeds into polite behavior, which again, taste um, what you are consuming is um, very much um, woven together with all of these. So to, mar to demarcate my um, educational text, I am trying to focus on materials designed for children and teenagers and centering, or what we call teenagers, and centering on explicit forms of education. And so I'm trying to use some of those others that I've mentioned, less obvious forms of, of educational text, to help me understand the culture of the period and what that education values. 
so key search terms. Now, right away, of course, Shakespeare, that sounds so easy. <laughs> but when you're trying to look at digital copies of text, uh, there's a lot of what's called dirty OCR. So um, when you look at, you're looking at EBO or ECHO, which are two databases for the early modern period or the 18th century, you're looking at um, digital photos of um, these texts. And to help you search those digital photos, those photos have been scanned, and then a plain text result of that scan has been put, uh, I like to think of it as behind, but um, connected to those images. Unfortunately, when those are scanned, especially when you're um, working with the, the typography of these periods, you get a lot of mistakes. I have noticed that in the past year, things have improved significantly, and they also, uh, Echo also allows for what's called fuzzy searching. So I can put in S-H-A-K-E um, asterisk, and then, uh, or I can even put in Shakespeare, and, it, and I can ask it to tell me things that it thinks are close to Shakespeare. So, but sometimes you, there's, there's two alternate spellings for Shakespeare, and sometimes I have to use an F instead of the S in the middle of the word because of the, the way the long S looks in 18th century typography. And then I've listed some of the other words that I've been using along with this, and I have found that this works the best when I look for those words in the title. So if I just, if I just do a search in a database for Shakespeare and teacher, or Shakespeare in lessons, I'm going to Anytime Shakespeare himself, and in addition, mentions lessons, it's going to come up. That's not really helpful to me. So these books are marketed, though. These books are marketed to students, to teachers, to tutors. So I found if I used these words in the title, I was getting much better results. Um, and of course, I have to look up student asterisks, because some books say student, and some books say students. Um, I haven't done all these searches. I've done about half of these. Some, like even just last night, I realized I added pedagogue to the list because I realized that was a useful term. So sometimes when I pull up a book and I see a word I hadn't thought of in its title, then I can add something to my search terms. So um, that is that's sort of a growing list. Um, another methodological problem is deciding how much is enough Shakespeare in a text. So to count as an educational text that is using Shakespeare to teach reading or writing or other um, textual learning. So for right now, and I'll explain why I'm saying for right now, I am excluding what are mostly just brief historical or artistic references. So Shakespeare listed in a chronology of the history of England, for example, um, it does not count for me. Or collections of portraits, which I found. Guides to monuments, you know, uh, tourism. So there, there are some books that are about, you know, when you go to Strat when you go to this region of England, go to Stratford on Avon and, and uh, see Shakespeare's home. I think it's very interesting and it's telling that you know Shakespeare is included in these, that he's already in, in this period on the literary tourism map, so to speak. And that's important to know. Um, but it's not necessarily a primary source that I need to study. I'm also excluding works, and these are pretty common too, that that quote Shakespeare just to buttress a point that's not necessarily related to Shakespeare. So, you know, um, talking about uh, women's proper behavior and then saying, as Shakespeare says, you know, lots, you know, and so on. Um, again, useful information to know that Shakespeare is being used in this way. Um, I have, my study has grown to include elocution. Now, I didn't think this was related at first. But then I realized what a gold mine this was in terms of Shakespeare in this period. Um, and I couldn't really ignore it. Oral expression, so elocution is when we still have these forensics 
or debating. Um, this is sort of the parent of this movement. Um, and there are many collections of uh, speeches to, that students would use in their declamations, and Shakespeare's included in many of those. Oral expression was an important part of textual education, so I decided that was really necessary to include. Some other brief references um, I at first excluded. For example, I found some grammar texts, almost like workbooks. I think these are the first examples of workbooks I've seen in my research um, that have sentences teachers can use to um, show to have students discover what is wrong with a sentence. Still commonly used on SATs, by the way, right? Find, find what's wrong in the sentence and correct it. Um, some Shakespeare sentences were used in those. And at first I thought, okay, this really is not about Shakespeare, I'm not gonna use this. But then I, as I did more reading, I realized it's kind of important to know that Shakespeare sentences are, were often considered faulty. <laughs> And that helped me buttress some other arguments I ended up making. So I, I mentioned that only to say that this methodology is really a recursive process. And I'm really trying to let the material speak to me. So some things I don't look at, later on I realize I should look at um, because of other research I've done. Um, so I'm really learning from the process what to look for. So these are just some of my introductory problems and research questions. But I also feel the need to justify the project culturally and historically as well. So why Shakespeare? Why the 18th century? Cultural and literary critics within the 18th century use Shakespeare to express crucial literary values. Indeed, it is through grappling with Shakespeare that they come to create these ideals in many cases. So as critics try to figure out what do we do with this Shakespeare guy, they are creating values about what literature is and how it should be used. And this links back to my project because literary values are then promulgated and reinforced through liter literacy training. That's why I'm interested in how students learn to read and write in the first place, because it, it tells us a lot about how um, literary texts are meant to be consumed. So I think my opening image shows how important Shakespeare was in this century, as does the statue which is a memorial put up in Westminster Abbey, um, a statue of Shakespeare in 1741. But first, to tell you why that's, to explain why that's remarkable, I need to back up and explain what happened to Shakespeare in the late 17th century. So of course, theaters were closed in the interregnum. Some, Shakespeare didn't go completely underground. He was preserved um, by traveling players, often short performances performed in pubs. Um, this is a title page um, of a work edited by Francis Kirkman, who is one of my favorite late 18th century publishers because he's such a wacky, eccentric guy. I kind of ex specialize in wacky, eccentric booksellers in my research. Um, this is also, I think, the first uh, picture of Falstaff. He's the, the chunky guy on the bottom mm. left corner. Um, although that is not one play, that, that is several plays, and they're not all Shakespearean. Uh, but this is a co collection of what Kirkman called drolls, short, short expert excerpts or performances that were publicly performed um, during the closing of the theaters. Um, once the theaters reopened in the Restoration, Shakespeare was just one of a number of early dra uh, dramatists being staged. Beaumont and Fletcher were actually more popular than Shakespeare um, in the 1660s. Shakespeare does catch up by the end of the century, 
But by then, the Restoration had and valued its own kind of theater, and Shakespeare was starting to seem old-fashioned to them. Some other points about this period. Um, only about one play in 12 was advertised with its author's name attached. And I don't, you can't really see this. This is a, this is a catalog, um, again, from Francis Kirkman advertising um, plays that he was selling. And it does list um, the authors, but it is not... It's in alphabetical order according to the titles of the page. So the authors are kind of almost incidental. And many of these, some you would recognize and some you would not recognize. Um, Pepys's, Samuel Pepys, we always get lots of information about late 17th century culture from Samuel Pepys. His situation is telling uh, between 1660 and 1669, so nine years, he uh, wrote in his diaries about going to the theater 350 times. Out of 350 times, he saw 41 performances of 12 plays by Shakespeare, including Macbeth nine times and The Tempest eight times. He only mentions Shakespeare's name, though, once in his diaries. So again, the name Shakespeare is not, um, he hasn't reached the celebrity author status. Um, he is still part of the culture, but you know, 41 out of 350 is not a very high ratio. By the way, Pepys hated Romeo and Juliet and found a Midsummer's Night stream in Sippet, so maybe he just wasn't a Shakespeare fan. Um, restoration drama, as we know, is kind of body, fast-paced, and witty. Uh, the, both the audience and the characters were elite. Um, it followed, or at least uh, what was most valued, was following the classical unities in terms of plot. This came from uh, French drama, which Charles II uh, discovered a love for when, he, when his court was in exile. It had spectacular stage effects. Poetic justice was preferred, so in other words, the good guys should really be alive at the end. Someone like Cordelia, a nice person, she shouldn't really die. So Shakespeare again was still performed, but authors, um, including Dryden, modified Shakespearean plays freely and often radically to meet these standards and the audience and what the audience expected. So just a couple quotes on uh, restoration writers on, ha on uh, Shakespeare. John Evelyn said on Hamlet in 1661, the old play began to discuss this refined age. And Dryden, again, Dryden was uh, very much a fan of Shakespeare, but he, even he said in 1679, it must be allowed to the present age that the tongue in general is so much refined since Shakespeare's time that many of his words and more of his phrases are scarce intelligible, and of those which we understand, some are ungrammatical, others coarse, and his whole style is so pestered with figurative expression that it is, is affected as it is obscure. So, you know, I guess Shakespeare's a little bit too pretentious for the uh, restoration <coughs> stage. Again, though, I don't want to imply that he ever completely fell out of uh, the canon, if we want to even call it a canon, of, of popular works. He is still enjoyed and appreciated, just n not as popular as he was in his own time, or as we will see later in the 18th century. So, now for the 18th century. This is really the resurgence of Shakespeare. Um, a reappreciation of him, mostly through the construction of, of Shakespeare as a natural genius. This natural genius, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that, um, was appreciated for his use of natural language, of strong characters, the expression of the passions, really his pathos. Um, the word heart is used a lot in, um, in 
18th century descriptions of why Shakespeare is so important. Throughout the century though, I mean it really up until the centuries end, there are still complaints about his flaws in plotting, his lack of refinement, and his mixing of genres. For some reason the 18th century is just really horrified by the idea of putting tragedy and comedy together. Um, this is also the period, and I'm going to talk about all, actually all of these bullet points in more detail. This is also the period which saw his recreation as a product of print, specifically uh, scholar, I'll talk about scholarly editions, popular editions, and his use in collections like anthologies and uh, my special area textbooks. This is the time period that saw the rise, really the birth of Shakespearean literary criticism. And lastly, and most importantly to my purposes, the use of Shakespeare in separating rhetoric uh, or the rules for writing from the study of the belles lettres or the appreciation of, of good literature. In earlier periods, these really were one category of learning, as I will discuss, and I've discussed this in many of my previous presentations here. Uh, but we can't talk, also can't talk about Shakespeare in the 18th century without mentioning the artist that did the most to make his plays um, extremely popular, David Garrick, who had his stage career from 1741 to um, 1776. Um, Garrick is importantly linked to the other aspects I mentioned because he really emphasized the passions is a very dramatic presence on stage, beloved, himself beloved. As you can see in this painting that is called the Apotheosis of Garrick, which imagines him after death being raised to Mount Olympus to be greeted by Shakespeare and the muses of comedy and tragedy, and bidding him farewell are the actors in character known for appearing with him in Shakespeare's plays. So I find this both amusing and touching, but it really, um, goes to show um, how much, uh, again, the pathos of Garrick did to emphasize that quality in Shakespeare's plays, and he is often discussed, as Shakespeare is, in terms of the brilliant characters that he created. So let me talk a little bit more about natural genius. So um, Addison and Steele are the first that really kind of uh, start promoting Shakespeare early in the century. And, and unlike, let's say, Dryden, Addison was able to do this by distinguishing what he called two classes of genius. The first, he said, consisted of those who formed themselves by rules, and the second, of those, quote, great natural geniuses that were never disciplined or broken by rules of art. This is a division in understanding uh, superior, superior artistic output um, that's going to prove very influential in this century. Um, those of you, whoever have taken even like the survey of that included 18th century, know about the, the ancients versus the modern debate. Um, this was a debate, uh, Swift talks about it a lot in terms of the bee versus the spider, about which kind of writing is better. Is the writing that calls on classical antecedents and really imitates and improves upon those standard forms, or writing that really kind of jumps sui generis, uh, fully formed without acknowledging past um, influences. That was the debate. Um, Swift used the bee uh, as the metaphor for the artist who goes and gathers honey from previous artists to create something that is delicious and delightful versus the spider who sits alone in her web and creates something out of nothing, just out of her own body, which of course is a web, which is really gooey and gross and icky. So we can see which one Swift <laughs> preferred. This is uh, in the Battle of the Books. Um, Addison and Steele, though, saw benefits in both. And this whole debate could emerge because of the new access 
to the media brought about by the expanding print market in this period. Print was, interestingly enough, 250 or so years old by this time. It is not new media. Um, but the lapsing of the Licensing Act and the easing of the grip of the, of the trade rules promulgated by the Stationers Guild opened up new opportunities to new sorts of authors, often less educated, unversed in Latin and Greek, and therefore not familiar with the rules of antiquity, and so ready to experiment with new genres and forms. So despite the fact that this is print itself is not new media, the 18th century is characterized by a, uh, not only a large number of new print products flooding the market, but new genres and new forms. So the periodical, um, the novel uh, becomes important. So for, for those reasons, I think it actually is a time very much like today where you have the Shakespeare app, as we were talking about beforehand. Um, you never know what the internet is going to cough up for our delight and, and, and enjoyment. Um, so by the end of the century, though, this concept of the natural genius was solidified by the Romantics and became understood as sort of the way to understand great literature. Um, but here we just see the seeds of it beginning. Um, I would also call out um, Samuel Richardson. He, his, he was an, um, a printer who was not educated in the classics, yet wrote the runaway bestsellers of the time, Pamela and Clarissa. Um, so I think his popularity um, helps this category advance. Um, in aesthetic philosophy, Edward Young's um, 1969 treatise, Conjectures on Original Composition, calls out both Samuel Richardson and mentions Shakespeare several times. So this is an, uh, an idea that's growing across the century and Shakespeare fits right into that. Um, in fact, Jack Lynch has said, Shakespeare is one of the archetypal original geniuses precisely because the idea of original genius emerged as a way of explaining the phenomena of Shakespeare. Genius is at the heart of Romantic era conceptions of art, but it was already being developed by 18th century critics of Shakespeare. The figure of the genius is the most enduring legacy that the 18th century Shakespeare critics passed on to subsequent ages. Okay, I also want to talk about Shakespeare as a um, print commodity. Two quotes from the secondary literature. In the 19th century, the Shakespeare text became, from a publishing point of view, a genuinely popular commodity to be mass produced, mass marketed, and mass distributed. Also, Jack Lynch in Becoming Shakespeare says, in 1700, virtually every literate family could be expected to own two books, the Bible and John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. By 1850, Shakespeare's plays had joined them on the shelf. So how did this happen? We really have to credit the bookseller Jacob Tonson and his descendants, who basically monopolized the Shakespeare market for the first three quarters of the 18th century. Um, Jacob Tonson purchased the putative rights to Shakespeare's works in 1707. And the reason I say putative is because the copyright law in this period, actually starting in 1709, limited um, rights to 14 years for new works and 21 years for um, older works, which would be Shakespeare. However, everyone pretty much ignored that law, and the common law practice was that individual booksellers, who are also publishers in this period, um, owned the rights, had a monopoly over those rights. We will, as we will see, that changes later in the century. Tonson is the publisher of Dryden, Milton, and Pope, so you can see that he is kind of specializing in more, a more literary market. 
And in 1709, he decides that it's time to bring out a new collected works. The fourth, folio, the fourth folio that Ken mentioned in his presentation was 25 years old at this time. So as you might imagine, you have a new generation who might want to um, purchase the brand new version. At this time, Tonson also started using Shakespeare's head as his shop sign and trademark. I'm kind of amazed by Tonson because you have to remember that at this time Shakespeare was not the icon that we know him as today. Um, so it's rather remarkable that he latched on to Shakespeare and made him the centerpiece of his career. Um, talk about being on the right side of history. But of course, he is, is creating this history. So I'm going to kind of quickly go over some of these. So there are very famous scholarly and critical editions that come out in this period that are all put out by the Thompson family. The first is the Roe edition, which is still a, uh, which is known to be the first in all these important areas, the first biography, the first to have a named editor on its title page. Um, and it's, it's still very, although it's not a folio anymore, it is still very much a luxury um, edition. Um, Pope comes up with an edition in 1725, which is known mostly for all the artistic license he took with it. He found uh, much of Shakespeare, like many in the 17th century, to be unrefined um, and was sure that the sources must be corrupt um, and that uh, he needed to bring it back to its original perversely by adding his own art, layer of art to it. Um, unfortunately for Pope, this had very disappointing sales. I'm not going to go through every edition here, um, but there are several in the period um, ending up in the 18th century with a total of 50 collected editions. Contrast that to the 17th century, which had the four folios across the whole century. Um, and this, this period then also brought about the birth of the editor, um, the emergence of an intense theoretical disputation in the realm of secular editing, the birth, we might say, of bibliography. Yet some people complained that all of this annotation and commentary was ruining Shakespeare. Um, in the midst of this growing cultural capital, the first educational text I've seen so far that incorporates Shakespeare is The Preceptor, edited by the bookseller Robert Dodsley, who some of you might have heard me present on before. Um, interestingly, and his, um, I don't know if you can see this, he has, um, he has two sections. The Preceptor is a volume that covers sort of everything the young student will need. It's sort of um, geared at, you know, a teenage student, what we would consider sort of high school age, um, junior high, high school. Um, he has a section, relevant to me, is a section on reading, speaking, and writing letters, and then um, separated a, a section on rhetoric and poetry. Interestingly, this section on rhetoric and poetry, which I'm just going to talk about briefly, was something that he copied from a published work that had come out in 1718. Um, and didn't contain any Shakespeare, not surprisingly, since, as we know, in 1718, Shakespeare wasn't that popular yet. However, uh, the preceptor is interesting because uh, Dodsley takes out some of the original examples from the 1718 edition and adds or substitutes five examples from Shakespeare. Um, these are examples that you are meant to appreciate and interestingly adds many other examples from living authors who Dodsley, the bookseller, published in his own shop. And so he is encouraging people to consider these fine works of literature and then come buy them in his shop. 
Uh, and speaking of business practices, it's important to understand the role of copyright in making Shakespeare freely available in the <coughs> last quarter of the century. <coughs> the additions I've mentioned, the, the Roe, the Pope, uh, Johnson, um, gave Shakespeare significant cultural capital, but copyright laws, it was only copyright changes in copyright law that made him much more freely available. It was really the linkage of these two that turned Shakespeare into the beloved celebrity author whose status remains until today. So um, the, as I said, the Act of Anne had limited copyright, but common law practice held rights to be perpetual. Taunton was challenged by a, a smaller bookseller named Robert Walker. Um, Taunton threatened to bring him to court um, as he did with many people who um, sort of stepped on his Shakespearean toes. But Robert Walker was the per first um, publisher who said, okay, go ahead, try it. And Tonson backed down. Robert Walker came out with his own um, uh, inexpensive editions, which forced Tonson to respond with his version of inexpensive editions. So it is this sort of um, fight over who has the rights that allows Shakespeare's popularity to really take off because suddenly he's affordable. This tension in the law was not resolved into, until a uh, law case called Donaldson versus Beckett. Donaldson was a Scottish bookseller known for what other booksellers considered pirating and he considered um, working within copyright law. I'm not going to go into details, but suffice it to say this trend ended up with lower cost editions, resulting in the publishing of editions doubling after 1775. So much so that in 1778, a writer in the Monthly Review observed that um, it may be thought that the rage for Shakespeare has been carried to excess and that editions have multiplied so fast that the public may now be said to be not only encumbered, but distracted with variety. So, wow, we went from having uh, not enough Shakespeare to having too much. And this is, I don't know if you know what a, a Google Ngram is. It allows you to look at the use of the word within the Google Books corpus. Um, and so I did one for Shakespeare. And this allows you to see, this is based on percentage of works in Google Books. You can see that the years between, say, 1760 and 1790, we have peak Shakespeare. So this is any reference to Shakespeare anywhere in a, in a text, not just title pages. So, but this really sets the, um, stage for understanding how students, um, I shouldn't say set the stage when I'm talking about Shakespeare, but especially Shakespeare in print. Um, how were students supposed to grapple with this larger than life figure? What relation did um, Shakespeare, his writing, have to their own writing? In the early modern period, students read the classics in order to gather material for their own compositions. Was, in the late 18th century, was one supposed to do this with Shakespeare? The short answer is no. The rise of ideas of natural genius that Shakespeare exemplified changed the student relationship, um, the relationship to literature from one of imitation to appreciation. This is why Hugh Blair, in his famous pedagogical lecture series in uh, 1783, could praise Shakespeare as a genius, while at the same time use his blemishes and transgressions as examples of what not to do. So, um, in his lectures, he discusses Shakespeare as um, a genius, but extremely flawed. He imp imputes those blemishes to the grossness of the age in which he lived. This is kind of an 18th century meme, really. He, pra he, he praises him for his animated and masterly representations of characters, so again, the characters, by the liveliness of his descriptions, the force of his sentiments, and his possessing beyond all writers the natural language of passion. He believes Shakespeare was a genius, but along with Homer, lacked taste, 
as was evidenced in instances of rudeness and indelicacy, which the more refined taste of later writers, who had far inferior genius to them, would have taught them to avoid. So Shakespeare is not a good example of taste, that important word. Um, in lecture 15 on metaphor, on using metaphors, Blair exclaims that in subjects of dignity, it is an unpardonable fault to introduce mean and vulgar metaphors. In fact, he is offended by the gross transgression of Shakespeare mentioning a dunghill in Henry V when he was talking about soldiers going up to heaven. Um, I don't have that quote with me. It's actually, if you know that, if you're familiar with it, it's a beautiful passage. I mean, I find it quite poignant, but not Hubler. <laughs> um, in the same lecture, he also critiques Shakespeare for too often using mixed metaphors, which Blair calls, indeed, one of the grossest abuses of this figure. So, you know, again, Shakespeare is a genius, but don't follow his writing style because it's it's problematic for students to do so. Here's another interesting example of the way Shakespeare was used in school. So um, this is, it's not really a textbook, it's a playbook, but it's a playbook based on a play that was given at a school. It's called The Roses, he's renamed it, or King Henry VI, a historical tragedy uh, represented at reading school October 15th, 16th, and 17th. So it's almost its anniversary. <laughs> or we missed its anniversary. Um, 1795, compiled principally from Shakespeare. And this is the second edition. So I think maybe the first edition was from a, a previous reading. I don't know who would be the audience for this. Like maybe other schools. Um, the preface does not say. Um, parents, obviously, community members, there's three performances, so I'm um, reading between the lines that this was probably popular in the community, and so people might have bought this as a souvenir. Um, the um, editor slash teacher um, slash um, narrator, he is all three of those, um, <coughs> says that the four last acts of the third part, uh, this is the four last acts of the third part of King Henry the Sixth furnished the plan of this dramatic piece. That the reader may have an idea of the difficulty of forming a tragedy neither offensive to delicacy nor repugnant to the principles of modern taste from these materials, he is requested to prove the original before he opens the following sheets. So obviously, the original was not going to be acceptable for a school audience, maybe not even an 18th century community audience. So in order to, for, for us to appreciate what a great job he did editing this, we're supposed to look at the original or remember the original and then um, appreciate that. In his preface, he also explains that um, he confined the plotting or the uh, location to England for unity of place. So there's those unities that had been popular since the Restoration. He contracts the duration of the play, also for um, purposes of unity. He suppresses, that's his word, the temporary defection, also his terms, of the Duke of Clarence, even though he admits that may, be his, that may have been historically accurate. And at the same time, he has added scenes, and in his words, the editor has not scrupled to take the liberty of introducing into this performance a few appropriate passages from the first and second parts of Henry VI, and even from the Richard II plays, which are not in possession of the stage. The religious and patriotic passages which are occasionally introduced were not merely inserted with the view of engaging the applause of audiences, right? These are very popular uh, set pieces which he's adding into this whose candor gave a generous encouragement to an exercise intended only to instruct the performers in the principles of chaste action and correct speaking. So he's saying, you know, the audience really appreciated this, but really we did it for the students. We just kind of appreciated their applause. There are, it is hoped, strict, they are, it is hoped, strictly characteristical. 
and the editor sees with pleasure the opportunity of instilling in the minds of his pupils sentiments calculated to inspire them with, and this he puts in all caps, fervent devotion to their God, disinterested loyalty to their king, and active love of their country. So that is the purpose of putting on this play, to instill through the acting of the play these sort of moral um, virtues, these moral uh, nationalistic and patriotic uh, virtues. So those are just some um, hints of some interesting things I've been finding. You can see this ends up being a huge project that goes in many different directions. Um, some future plans, some, some areas I want to explore. I would like to create a um, bibliography of Shakes, all the Shakespearean educational works, um, categorize them, and then um, some things to think about, some um, uh, places I'm looking for, conclusions. I'm interested in this emphasis on characterization and the realism of Shakespeare, because I see that that might be a link to the rising novel in this period, which used both of those characteristics to advertise itself. And there has been work done showing that novelists often used Shakespeare, um, but I like to see the way that studies of Shakespeare also buttress the novel as a genre. Especially I'm interested with the emphasis that in, in novels of this identification it forces readers have with a character. So when you read a novel, in 18th, and this was discussed widely in the 18th century, readers sort of slip into a role. You become Robinson Crusoe. You become Pamela. Um, this was considered very scary in the 18th century. So I'd like to think about this connection to embodied, act, embodied acting on the one hand and disembodied novel reading on the other. Um, uh, as I said, I have more to think about in terms of the elocution movement and that's relationship to reading or writing, especially with the student embodying the words of a writer. And then more broadly, how do these texts position the student's learning body and what rhetorics of embodiment are, able in, are enabled by a Shakespearean curriculum? And I'm hoping that you will uh, point out to me some other places to look and some other um, things to think about as I continue forward with this research over the next five months. So thank you very much. Um, I was struck by Tonson's use of Shakespeare's head mm -hmm. as his brand. Yeah. Um, in some ways it makes perfect sense because he's obviously positioning himself as the publisher and seller of these, you know, these classical figures and Shakespeare is going to be the, as you point out, he hope, he's hoping to make this, but... It's a risk. Yeah, well, and, and why do we know what Shakespeare looks like? A guy who was rather famously not well portraited in his life. Um, yet if I say you know, Shakespeare, picture William Shakespeare, everyone in the room can do it. If I say picture Herman Melville, nobody can. Um, why did the icon in the 18th century uh, of, of Shakespeare's head, why was that already something that he could tap into? Well, I can't speak to how it was used in the folios. As I haven't looked back that far, and that's not really my area. But in the 18th century, you are seeing more and more frontispieces with authors' faces as this idea of authorship as, as the person of the author um, becomes important because of its relationship to genius. So when you're talking about traditions that are more collaborative or traditions that um, are um, uh, connected to imitation more, the person of the author is not as important. As originality becomes more and more important, you see more pictures of the author. Readers want to feel that there is this mind behind what they're reading that they can connect and relate to.
So I think that explains how it maybe circulates in print. I think the Shakespeare's head idea both um, goes back to those folios and is a, a really a calculated risk going forward. So does someone want to follow up on that question? All right, someone have a drink. Um, I have a question. I, I guess you're, the closest thing you've talked about to this is the um, the reading school's performance book, but I'm wondering if you've come across many teaching editions, I mean, not just edited, annotated editions, but editions of Shakespeare's plays meant for teaching that are similar to the ones in circulation now that are either um, paraphrased or otherwise sanitized for young learners, you know, specifically addressing that issue of Shakespeare's taste and then either taking out sections or changing the language because that that's in the media a lot now about how Shakespeare's yeah. taught. I wonder if you see anything. Yeah, like I mean, right at the end of the century, this is isn't necessarily for educational purposes, but you have, a, uh, or the beginning of the 19th century, Boulder's famous edition, which is uh, sanitized for families and mm -hmm. gives us the word boulder, boulderize the text. Right. And um, the Lambs, Charles Lamb and his sister, Very good. yeah, thank you, <laughs> um, create in the uh, beginning of the 19th century, and I do want to actually explore this in more detail. I'm really interested in learning more about, they, they created children's, children's mm -hmm. stories based on Shakespearean plays. So that's really kind of a modern um, children's book. I mean, we, st we still have children's Shakespeare's. It's interesting then, unless you find earlier ones, that there's kind of a lag between deciding Shakespeare's in poor taste for learners and then giving them an alternative Shakespeare that, that kind of cleans it up for them. You know? Usually he's in, excerpts for right. students, not um, entire plays. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe because they're so un seen as unwieldy and, mm -hmm. and, and problematic, as I said. Yes. I just recently got a tiny little couple volumes of little children's books of mo modern versions of Shakespeare's stories for kids. I thought, what age group is going to do? I know I just was like that to me was an uh, aside, and, and that so that that con tradition continues. But it seems to me that Shakespeare is such a rich thing. But the thing that got me when I went to London, Ontario, and went there and went and just saw Shakespeare as an industry today, you're 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 you got me to, to think about how we, how that developed. I mean, what what is it that that we do, that, we, that, that we are the themes that we are taking in today as Shakespeare is it is it the romantic part that you were talking about with Byron, or is it this learned? I mean, because he's quoted by scientists, by philosophers, by poets. Everybody quotes him. But what's, I don't understand what's what's the question. My question is: My question is how you you elaborate on the history of how he developed. But how is our modern sensibility different from that of the 18th century? Is I, it the I think same or is it continuing? I think that the Shakespeare that is born in this century is the Shakespeare that we still have with us. I think that is why, um, for example, we teach probably what, f at least five sections of Shakespeare a year here to lower level and usually one upper level every you're not counting graduate courses. Um, so, and let's say Jane Austen, who maybe is the, the person who is the closest in celebrity status. Um, we teach her every several years, <laughs> one every several years. So I, I, I'm probably biased, but I think this is starts in the 18th century. All right. A couple of minor points. Though. By the way, the quote from Pride, about Shakespeare being unintelligible. That's got, yeah, that gets reprised in the Oregon Shakespeare Festival deciding that they're going to translate Shakespeare's plays into mm -hmm. more understandable English. I did okay. see that. Uh, yes, you're uh, right. My friend James Shapiro said it's like uh, taking a, a well-made IPA and converting it to Bud Light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we we posted historical. that on the English Facebook page. <laughs> a couple of uh, historical points. I think you underplay popularity of Shakespeare's name or the marketability of Shakespeare's name 
when his name appears on Porto in the late 1590s, I think 1597, that's very unusual. You sell plays by saying it's this title plus performed by these players at this theater. When you slap Shakespeare's name on it, all of a sudden that's a new game. And that makes it possible for a William Jagger, for example, in 1599, to market a book called The Passion of Pilgrim by William Shakespeare, a fraudulent publication with only a little bit of Shakespeare in it. All those plays in the 17th century that are part of the Shakespeare apocrypha, plays that get ascribed to him that weren't written by him, are done to market his name, uh, to use his name for marketability purposes. So uh, maybe by the restoration, maybe, the example you brought from Keats is true, that they're focusing on plays themselves, but this, and there may be a great increase in the marketability of Shakespeare's name in the, in the 18th century, but it's not quite so low profile. Yeah, and I, I don't want to, I don't, yes, I, I actually don't want to overstate that binary. Um, so he, he becomes a lot more popular and gets this iconic status in the 18th right, century. Right, right. But he wouldn't have even survived in the 18th century if, he, if his works hadn't That's still been a good point. cycling right. through the theaters. Yeah. And I mean, I guess one could argue that the fact that his name was not on playbills in the Restoration was because everyone knew, knew who wrote right. Hamlet. One other bibliographical note. Uh, you mentioned the, the Octavo collected Shakespeare. Uh, I don't know if you know D.F. McKenzie's essay on publication of Congreve. Uh, he says that a, a, a kind of watershed moment in publishing history for drama comes when Congreve is published in a set of octavo volumes. Octavo is more prestigious than, than throwaway folio, uh, throwaway quartos, which are only 30 or 40 pages. And it's a it's by the time that you get the octavo of Shakespeare, it's a prestigious publishing format for literature. So it's not it's not the prestigious folio versus the, the trashy octavo. No, the octavo, the octavo form, which has to be substantial and it's soul bound, mm -hmm. is is, a, is in itself a prestigious form. And folios are not. I don't know. I, you may know more about ancient history, publishing history, but uh, I don't know how many works other than encyclopedias. And, and, and it's not a popular. Form. It's not a popular no. medium anymore no. for, for literary. So, right. so the octavo kind of takes over from the earlier folio mediums as a, a, a prestigious publishing format. That's good to know. Thank you. I don't, uh, I don't know if there, there are any such things, but I, I wonder if there are Shakespeare play um, chapbooks. Uh, That's a really good question. And there are ballads. Shakespeare ballads. There are ballads, yeah. Oh, uh, but by my period, those are... Yeah, they're on their way out of it, but as a trend. Yeah, especially for children, that yeah, would be I really... Because um, there's, for sure, like Rafferty Crusoe. I, yeah, so when I have studied chapbooks, I haven't come across references to Shakespeare there. Either popular people, or fables, or fairy tales, but I haven't specifically looked for that, and that would be fascinating. And that seems like it could, could very well be shortened, condensed, popular versions. Thanks for that tip. Um, whole read, um, appreciated how Germans liked Shakespeare, uh, but uh, he was very critical of the way French people were critical of Shakespeare. So, have there been any kind of a comparative study for people like me uh, about uh, the reading habits of the, those people of the three countries in that period? The reading habits of 18th century? Right. Oh. I'm sorry? I don't know. Several books. I can send you some. Yeah, but let me write you an email that I will appreciate. Sure. Sure. I'm, I'm just going to curious, is, is there a, a different way that Americans have treated Shakespeare versus the British? Have the British and American approach to Shakespeare been, been different? There's a good book on that called Shakespearean Educations. Um, I don't remember the editor's name. 
Um, so um, mostly they are using British, well in the period I'm studying, like the colonial period, they're still using British Im, uh, imprints and importing them over. The school Shakespeare seemed to be used in a similar way. Um, there was one uh, study in that collection. Um, they were looking at a schoolmaster who had several plays. They don't, <laughs> it's listed in his will as several copies of a, uh, or several different plays. Um, and the researcher is kind of saying they might be Shakespeare. Um, so might have been used in the classroom, but really hard to tell. There's, there's a volume in the Library of America that Tim Shapiro just had to call Shakespeare in America. Oh, I didn't About know that one. About 600 pages covering the whole span of American history and how Shakespeare shows up in, in the broader, broader culture. Yeah. But lots of elocution. I mean, I think the elocution movement was even more popular in the United States than in Britain because you had so many immigrants, you had people with all kinds of different accents, and to try to regularize that and to help people climb this, again, climb the social ladder, elocution was used to teach people how to pronounce words correctly or authoritatively. Um, and Shakespeare was used a lot in the elocution movements. There's also an interesting article in there about the um, Shakespeare plays put on by African Americans, um, put on by workers groups, and put on by women, too. So I'll look at the Shapiro um, collection, but this other one is good, too. Has anyone uh, written a, has anyone done a similar study on the audience of Shakespeare plays in China, Japan, and Korea? I don't know the answer to that. I was looking that would into be really it interesting. I found it very fascinating. It's a three different world and their relations are so different based on their culture. culture yeah, culture. I don't know, but that would be a fascinating study for someone to do. Thanks, everyone.